Okay, so we are back. Uh, having looked at the mechanical side of this history of AI, we want to now look at the philosophical side as to you know this notion of the mind. What is the notion of the mind? How did this notion of the mind ever come out? And how can we get it across to the machines essentially? So the medieval view world view in Europe was basically a Christian adaptation of Greek ideas essentially. There was a big gap between the Greeks and medieval Europe, but these ideas that we Greeks started off with eventually ended up in medieval Europe. And the view of the world was of course, that it was a very anthropocentric view of the world. That humans were at the center of the universe and everything revolved around the earth essentially. So, we look at some of those ideas and so what we are trying to see is how did human beings as sentient beings come up with the notion of the mind. How would you even imagine that there is something called a mind? I mean you, of course, you are there in the world, you are immersed in the world and you are interacting with the world, but how do you come to this conclusion that you have thoughts and ideas which are in some sense existing independently. So, we start with the platonic view of the world, the idea of which came from Plato. He said that in the perfect world, there are these creators ideas, the gods ideas and our ideas, the human ideas are derived from gods ideas and the world itself is derived from God's ideas. So, it is a very platonic, platonic view of this whole world and the world was corruptible materialization of God's ideas that you know that is why things were not perfect in the world. Even though God's ideas were perfect, the world is not perfect and likewise our thoughts are true to the extent that they are accurate copies of God's ideas. That was the first starting point Plato. Then we move, we move on to Aristotle. Aristotle did away with the idea of a God and he said that the world is out there and human ideas are human ideas and they in some way correspond to the world essentially. So, our thoughts resemble the objects that they stand for. So, if I am thinking of an apple, then my thought of an apple resembles the apple in some sense. This is known as the correspondence theory of truth essentially and one branch of philosophy which was it was taken up was by Ludwig Wittgenstein, who in his early works postulated something called the picture theory of language essentially. That behind every word there is a picture, an image which is sitting out there essentially. Okay. So, this is how the world as we saw it, the earth was flat at the center of the universe with the gods heavens rotating around it essentially. The sensible world, the world that we could sense was composed of five elements, quintessence which was constant in the heavens did not change, constant in that sense and four other elements which was fire, earth, water, fire, air, water and earth listed in decreasing order of weight essentially. So, you can find similar ideas all over the world about you know what is the basic elements of the world essentially. So, if you ignore quintessence which is there in the heavens, you have fire, earth, water and earth, air and they are all jumbled up on earth trying to find or striving to find their right plus rightful place. Rightful place meaning by order of weight essentially, earth should be the lowest and then there should be water and then air and then fire and different materials had different amounts of these four elements in them and that is why they behaved differently. So, for example, wood had more water and therefore, and some air and therefore, it floated on, on water essentially. Whereas, iron had more earth and therefore, it sank in water essentially. So, they could explain why wood floated whereas, iron sank and so on and, and if wood were to catch fire 
then you know it would try to ex escape into air. So, they had this kind of explanations uh, about the world essentially. And this is how the color inside these circles is supposed to represent the color of the sky. So, you know we have morning, daytime, evening and night. And as the sun, it depends upon the position of the sun, as the sun rotates, uh, our day changes essentially. So, this is a small animation I created of what we thought about the world to be like. This is how the world was. You know, all the heavens were rotating around and around the earth, and the earth was the center of the universe essentially. Now, in those days astronomy was for many reasons a very important science and it was a very empirical science, but it was difficult to explain the motions of the planets. For those of you who are interested in astronomy, you would know that the stars are always in the same position. The constellations that we see Leo or Virgo or uh, any of these constellations, they always appear in the same fixed pattern throughout the year. It is only the planets which you know move from one constellation to another and it was very difficult to explain how they were operating essentially. So, King Alfonso of Spain in 13th century got so upset that he said that if God had consulted me when creating the universe, he would have received good advice. You know why have these planets move around in this erratic fashion essentially. It is a quotation I have got from uh, McDermott's book, I should have mentioned it there. Then along came Copernicus, Copernicus essentially. Okay. So, this is the first and this is what Hoggeland says, the wedge between thought and reality. The first wedge between thought and reality was inserted by Copernicus who says that what we see is not what really is. So, up till now, you know remember this picture theory, the, truth, the, uh, the notion of correspondence that our thoughts are in the image of what we see around us and that kind of a thing, that our thoughts reflect the world as it is, Copernicus was the first person who came and you must be familiar with his book on revolutions of the celestial spheres. He said that it that the earth is not at the center of the universe. In fact, the earth revolves around the sun and earth rotates and creates the illusion of day and night and that kind of a stuff essentially. The important thing from our point of view is that what we see is not what really is out there essentially. Hmm? So, the wedge as uh, Hoggeland says between thought and reality. So, all these famous characters you have encountered them in one way or the other. So, we know Galileo, Galilei because of the equations of motion for example, we always attribute them to Galileo, V is equal to u plus a t and you know that kind of stuff. But Galileo made this very important observation. He said that perception is an internal process. He says and this is quoted to him, I think that tastes, odors, colors and so on and are no more than mere names as so far as the object in which we locate them are concerned. So, if you are smelling a rose and you feel that the rose smells nice it is nothing to do, this, the notion of the smell of the rose is not located in the rose, but it is located in our minds. So, he says taste, odors, colors and so on are no more than mere names so far as the object in which we locate them are concerned and that they reside in consciousness in our minds in other words. And he says that hence if the living creature were removed that we as the perceivers of this taste and smell and odor were removed, all these qualities would be wiped, wiped away essentially. That this notion of taste and smell and color is something that we have in our heads, it is not a property of the object essentially. So, he goes on to explain for example, uh, he imagines that you know uh, the notion of smell actually happens because there are these particles which are impinging upon the inside of our noses, which results in certain sensations which we call as smell essentially. It is very accurate as you can see, but Galileo said this, 
in the 17th century essentially that perception is an internal process essentially. So, the, we, are, we are exploring this notion of thinking how the notion of a mind ev evolves you know in the. So, all this is European history because AI as we know it came out of European thought essentially. essentially. So, even though for example, other civilizations like Indian ph philosophy has a lot to say about such some of these concepts like knowledge and so on, but we are not I mean AI did not come out of that essentially. Then Galileo says that philosophy is written in this grand book the universe, it is written in the language of mathematics and its characters are triangles, circles and other geometric figures. So, when Galileo was doing all this reasoning, algebra had not yet been invented essentially. In fact, his proofs of the equations that we attribute to him like V is equal to u plus a t are essentially geometric in nature. So, if you look at Hogeland's book, you will see some idea of how he draws triangles and says that this side represents this, this side represents that and the area represents this and you know that kind of thing. All his reasoning was done for him mathematics was geometry and he says that the whole world can be described in mathematics, the language of mathematics and its characters are triangles, circles and other geometric figures essentially. So, you can see this another step away from the fact that our ideas are reflections of the real world out there. He is saying that you can think of motion, the laws of motion are about moving bodies using the language of mathematics. So, the very already the representation has moved to something which is different from the real world out there essentially. Next, we look at Okay. So, Galileo showed that geometry could be used to represent and reason about motion, this is what we just said. Then we come to the person who Hogeland calls as the grandfather of AI, it was the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes 1588-1679, who per first put forward the view that thinking is a manipulation of symbols. This is fundamental to AI essentially, because after all we are talking about representing symbols and manipulating them and creating intelligence out of them essentially. So, Galileo had said that reality is mathematical in the sense that everything is made of, of particles and our sense of smell or taste as how we reacted to those particles. Hobbes extended this notion to say that thought too was made up of or expressed in particles which the thinker manipulated. Okay. So, Galileo is talking about external reality and how we can represent think about that or talk about that. Hobbes is talking about the internal process of thinking and saying that even thinking is basically the manipulation of something which he called as particles which we now call symbols essentially. However, he had no answer to the question of how can a symbol mean anything okay. because we will see that for us intelligence is manipulating of symbols in a meaningful fashion and Hobbes could never say how can a symbol mean anything. In fact, as Hogeland says he could not distinguish, he could not tell us how minds are different from books in the sense that books are also collections of symbols and minds are also you know collections of symbols which we are manipulating, how can the two, two be different. Because the idea of meaning is very elusive. So, if I were to ask you how do you know the meaning of a word? How would you, what would your answer be? <coughs> Just take any word, let us say. So, you could use examples or something like that. Okay. So, in, in particular, I am sort of talking about our standard source of meaning, which is a dictionary. So, if you want to look up a meaning of a word, uh, you go and look up a dictionary. How does a dictionary give us meaning essentially? Because dictionary is only describing words in terms of other words essentially. When you give examples also you are giving examples in terms of other words. Where does the meaning originate from? 
I mean is there a fundamental source of meaning actually? This is a kind of difficulty which Hobbes faces. Where does meaning come from essentially? We are also not able to say where, where the meaning comes from. See for the people before him that the notion of an apple is because you see an apple and that is what it means essentially. Okay. But when we talk about language and thought and symbols, we have this difficulty of saying where does the meaning come from essentially. It is a question that we do not, we have not yet answered today essentially. This is a picture of Thomas Hobbes in the 16th century. His book called De Corpore, Hobbes first describes the view that reasoning is computation. Okay. So, he is saying reasoning is computation. By reasoning he says I understand computation and to compute is to collect the sum of many things added together at the same time or so this is a very archaic language essentially or to know the remainder when one thing has been taken from another. To reason therefore is same as to add or to subtract. So, again like Leibniz said and adding subtracting arithmetic is similar to other kinds of reasoning is similar to this kind of process essentially. So, this quote I have taken from this source which is the Stanford encyclopedia of philosophy and as we have just mentioned Hobbes was influenced by Galileo just as geometry could represent motion thinking could be done by manipulation of mental symbols essentially. Does the name Hobbes ring a bell? Hmm? Calvin and Hobbes right. In fact, Hobbes was named after Thomas Hobbes. So, Bill Watterson the author of Calvin and Hobbes named him after Thomas Hobbes. That is why he is such a philosophical character. When we come to Rene Descartes again another great thinker from the middle times. We know him for many things including the Cartesian coordinates are named after Descartes. He had come remember that all this thing was going on this talking statues moving things and so on and so forth and it had become sort of acceptable in Europe to talk about these machines as being like us in some sense essentially. So, Descartes in fact goes on to say that animals are wonderful machines, he, he just makes this next step that they are they are not like machines, they are machines essentially and then he says human beings were to accept for that they possess something called a mind essentially. We will come to this Descartes, Descartes problems in a moment. So, just as Galileo said that motion can be expressed in geometry, Descartes said that geometry could be expressed in algebra. Descartes is the one who invented this so called coordinate geometry and that kind of thing, but he went further. He says that even thought can be expressed in the language of mathematics and thoughts themselves are symbolic representations. So, you can see he is building upon what Hobbes has said. Hobbes said thoughts are symbols and now he is saying that thoughts are symbolic representations that we operate upon essentially. But this is something which is new which Descartes brought brings in the notion of the mind and the body. So, Descartes is what we call as a dualist or, or belongs to this thinker which says that you know mind and body are two separate things. So, we also often call it the mind body dualism. So, as opposed to dualism there are schools of thought which are monoist in nature which believe that there is only one kind of thing. Okay. So, for the first time Descartes is saying there are two different kinds of things in this world. One is this material world which he calls a body and the other is the mental world which he calls as a mind and he says that there are two different kinds of things. The, the material world of course, would obey the laws of physics and things like that and we will see later that you know philosophers said that mental world also should obey such laws and so on, but they are different world. Mind, the world of mind is separate and the world of body is separate and this is opposed to other kinds of philosophies, other kinds of views in philosophies. The, that there is only one kind of thing. So, there is a world of idealism which says that there is only the world of ideas. So, for example, in India we say there is everything is Maya we say right. There is everything is a world of ideas and matter is basically a construct that comes out of our ideas. 
very complicated to think about, but maybe you can reflect upon that a little bit. As opposed to idealism, the other world is materialism, which says that everything is matter and the whole world is matter and the matter interacts in a certain way and ideas and minds and all these kind of stuff, things, they emerge out of this essentially, somehow essentially. So, there are different viewpoints about what the world is like there and Descartes was a dualist. He said that mind and body are two separate things and he says that a symbol and what it symbolizes are two different things. So, if I say chalk as a symbol, it is a compound symbol made up of these letters, so, but it is nevertheless a symbol. So, chalk is a symbol and this thing that I am holding in my hand is what it symbolizes. So, this notion that chalk, the symbol chalk is <coughs> separate and then we have this problem that a symbol is amenable to algebraic manipulation. So, you can do thinking, what we call as thinking is basically symbol manipulation, which you can manipulate symbols and the subject of thought is the world, the real world out there, what it symbolizes and they are different things, the mind is different and the body is different essentially. Of course, here to answer questions like you know, because see the body or the material world obeys laws of physics and, and the mind of course, it was not clear how it operated, but it was separate. So, you have to answer questions like this, when what makes a notation or a symbol notation suitable for symbolizing and secondly, what makes a suitable notation actually symbolize. See this problem has occurred because he has separated the world of the mind and the body. He says the mind is one thing and the, and the body is another thing, a symbol is one thing and what it symbolizes is another thing. So, the question is what makes a note, notation suitable for symbolizing? Now, that is a question that we are addressing now uh, when we write algorithms, uh, when we talk about knowledge representation, then we are addressing this issue as to you know what is this, how do you represent, how do you create a domain model for example, how do you represent the world so that you can you know compute upon that essentially. That is the easier part, but the more difficult part is what makes a suitable notion actually symbolize essentially which means that if it is to be meaningful in nature, then the world of symbols or the world of thought should be connected in some ways to the material world or the world of matter, because they cannot be independent of each other, they can, they are not different worlds that are you know operating independently. Our world of thoughts is sort of in close synchrony to the world of matter essentially. If we raise our hands, if we think about raising our hands, we actually raise our hands essentially and you know, that kind of, how does the interaction take place between the world of thought and the world of matter. So, the question is how can thought and matter interact, because you know the world of thought is different, matter of course, very behave sort of uh, obeys the laws of physics, what about the world, the world, the world of thought is not made of matter, it is a different world, how can it interact with matter, that is a question that he could never answer the mind body problem essentially or the mind body dualism essentially. So, this brings us to what we can call as a paradox of mechanical reason, this term is by John Hogeland in his book and the paradox is that if reasoning is a manipulation of meaningful symbols according to rational rules. So, remember that we are talking about manipulating symbols like Leibniz says, there are well defined ways of manipulating these ideas, uh, it is not like you are doing it randomly. So, according to well defined rules, so if reasoning is a manipulation of symbols according to this rational rules, who is manipulating the symbols? Because this question of meaningful manipulation has come into it, the, our thoughts are not independent of the real world essentially they have to be connected to that essentially. So, if a fast bowler is running up and bowling, thinking of bowling an in swinger or something, he better be able to produce a real in swinger if he is worth his salt. How is his thoughts related to the real world essentially? Who is 
manipulating the symbols essentially. It is a difficult question to answer, because what people say is that it can either be mechanical according to some fixed set of rules or it can be meaningful, but how can it be both? You cannot have a mechanical system being meaningful at the same time and by meaningful we mean paying attention to the meaning of what is happening. How can a mechanical manipulator pay attention to meaning essentially? So, remember that, that they are not talking about AI or any such thing, they are talking about human cognition, they are talking about human minds, how human minds operate essentially. So, they are trying to analyze that essentially and Descartes has said that there is a world of the mind it which is symbol processing and then there is a world of the body which is the real world made up of physical matter, but they are closely tied together. So, when I am thinking about some real world in a meaningful fashion. So, if I got two pieces on a table like let us say a cake and a sandwich, I am thinking about them and I have to decide should I pick up one of them. I am thinking about some real things in the world in a meaningful fashion. My thoughts about this cake and a sandwich are about real things and I am making some decisions should I eat this or should I not eat this or something like that. I am so this meaningfulness where does that come from essentially. How can a mechanical manipulator pay attention to meaning? It is a question I would ask you to ponder over a little bit and see whether you know maybe like Penrose said human beings are special, there is something special happening in our brains which allows us to do this or like Dreyfus said that there are some instincts that we have which we cannot automate essentially, but of course I believe I take the opposite view. So, so, this led to a lot of debate in his time, this is we are talking about Descartes still René Descartes and his mind body dualism and some people attribute the fact that you know go, it is said that Descartes who also gave us the phrase cogito ergo sum I think therefore I am, he apparently he is claimed to have a proof of that God exists essentially and, it, and the proof is tied to the fact that there is this difficulty about how do symbols, how do symbols get manipulated in a meaningful fashion essentially. But uh, his contemporaries of course, did not accept any such thing and they would in fact mock him about you know this idea of a. So, you can imagine a little bit like the Chinese room which we have not discussed in detail but just imagine that your brain is like a Chinese room full of symbols and there is somebody manipulating those symbols according to some rules. Who is that somebody? That is a question that we are asking. Hmm. So, people would mock at Descartes and say oh there is a little man sitting in your head who is doing manipulating the symbols, but the problem is as you can imagine this explanation does not work because the next question that you would ask is how does a little man operate? So, little man has a little brain in his little body which has little symbols inside his head and who is manipulating those symbols. So, there comes an infinite regress essentially and people say that this is what led to Descartes claim that he can prove that God exists essentially. But in the real world what was happening as to this question to who people philosophers have tried various kinds of explanations something called the faculty of will which we cannot quite define or transcendental ego or as I said the people who used to mock him and say there is a human killers. Remember the human killers was made by Parcelsus, a little man sitting inside his head essentially. So, that is a that is a fundamental question one has to answer which says that if you are in modern day world going to write programs which will operate according to the algorithms that you are putting into those programs how can they be doing meaningful things essentially. So, it is roughly equivalent to that essentially or I might say that if I were to implement a neural network uh, which is uh, I know that the structure of a neuron how it operates and so on and so forth and I am just connecting together hundreds of thousands of neurons, how can that ever do meaningful things like character recognition. Of course, we know that it can be done character recognition can be done, 
But the fundamental question is that is it intelligent or is it sub doing something that we have asked it to do? In fact, Ada Lovelace had said that the computer can only do what it is instructed to do and nothing more than that, which is of course true at a very fundamental level. So, some recent thoughts on who is doing this manipulation of thinking. There are some very interesting books and for those of you who are interested, I would recommend them. All of three have a common author called Douglas Hofstadter, who is in the Indiana University. His famous book called Godel Escher Bach and uh, he and Dennett wrote a series of, collected a series of articles called The Mind's Eye and more recently he's written a book called I Am A Strange Loop essentially. So, he's trying to, Hofstadter is also trying to answer this question. I mean, instead of saying who, he's saying what is this notion of I that I have as a, as a human being that I have essentially hmm. or I or you essentially. So, if I talk of you as a person, what do I really mean? What is that you essentially? So, I say that my body, my mind, my hands, my eyes, my feet, my whatever. What is this I which is saying my essentially? That is a question which Hofstadter is trying to answer and he sort of uses a combination of emergent behavior and self-referential loops which we do not have time to get into here essentially. But I would recommend one of these books, they are quite easy to read and quite engrossing. Okay, so, let us move on from Descartes, so John Locke known as the uh, father of classical liberalism. His theory of mind is often cited as the origin of mo modern concept of identity and the self essentially and it influenced other philosophers like Hume that we will see and Kant that we will see in a moment. He postulated that mind was a blank slate as opposed to what Chomsky says that we are born with an inbuilt grammar called the universal grammar in our heads. Locke said that the mind was a blank state or tabula rasa as he called it and that we are born without innate ideas and as you can see in the last two lines that knowledge is determined by experience derived from sense perception. That whatever we know in our heads is the result of whatever we have experienced in the world and experience leads to knowledge essentially. So, one of his uh, collaborators, followers, David Hume, Scottish philosopher, whom Hogeland calls as a mental mechanic and by this we mean a mechanic who is operating in the mental domain. He was an empiricist and in his book called The Treatise of Human Nature, he strove to create what he called as a science of man that examine the psychological basis of human nature. He said that everything is tied up to human nature. If you can understand human nature, you can understand how human beings behave and what else is there essentially. So, science and everything derives from that. He follows this idea of experience and observation as a foundation of logical argument and he was an admirer of Newton and he says in the manner in which Newton expressed the mo movement of heavenly bodies over planets and so on. He says that impressions and ideas are like basic particles to which mental forces and operations are applied. Just as Newton is giving the laws of physics, Hume, in, Hume is saying that there is a law of mental activity, law of associations as he called it, that they were mental ideas were like particles. He is not saying that they were particles, he is saying they are like particles to which mental forces and operations are applied. Further, like Newton, he does not care as to how that is happening. So, Newton never explains how gravity happens or you know why gravity happens and you know there is no explanation behind there. He just gives the laws of gravity and says that this is how planets are moving around the earth and it is explained by gravity. So, Hume does the same thing, he does not try to explain how it is happening, he says this is what is happening and it can be explained by this laws, do not ask me why it is happening like that. But he could not explain, however, what made ideas ideas now. No, it is like that once you say these are particles which are obeying these laws, then okay, why are they ideas essentially? Okay. And what 
makes their interaction between different ideas count as thinking essentially. So, he is done away with the meaning altogether. Hmm? So, the last person we will visit today is Immanuel Kant, German philosopher widely considered to be central to modern philosophy. In fact, when I was an undergraduate, we had a whole course which did a comparative analysis of Kant and Mill's philosophy. He says, and this is very interesting. So, we have come a long way in this short period of time from this notion that the world is out there and we are simply seeing the world, you know, the correspondence theory of knowledge and then mind body dualism and then so. Kant has come to the other extreme. He says the mind has a priori principles which makes things outside conform to those principles. And these are some very consistent with some very modern ideas essentially. So, for example, some very recent research in computer vision. So, the, the simple view of computer vision would be like the correspondence theory of knowledge that you, you, you get the image of things and you do image processing, pattern recognition, feature extraction, all this kind of stuff and then you understand what is happening. It is a forward process from the world to the mind. Modern theory says that we have preconceived notions of what we are trying to see and what we see is already there in, in our minds to some extent. This is what Kant has said, that the mind has a priori principles which make things outside conform to those principles. Then he says the mind shapes and structures experience, it is a mind which shapes structures and experience. So, that on the abstract level all human experience shares essential structural features. So, all our minds operates in the same way that is why we are able to communicate. You know, that is a question that one could have asked, how can you know one human being communicate ideas to another human being essentially. So, he says that fundamentally the mind has a similar structure. Then he of course, goes, to, goes on to explain that the concept of space and time are integral to human ex experience that you cannot operate without them as are the notions of cause and effect essentially. So, how, what causes what? Causal theory is basically a mental theory. I mean, in the real world, I mean we have this cause and effect kind of a notion that if I turn a switch on the light will come on, but the physics does not recognize any cause causal theory. The physics only recognizes equations. So, it goes from one equilibrium state to another equilibrium state. There is no causal things, but they, these are fundamental to our thinking essentially. So, the, the second last paragraph is, is very interesting. He says that we do not have direct experience of things and we will visit this in the next class which we have on Wednesday. We will come back to this question of the, the, the as he called it the, the nominal world or the real world I would say. We do not have direct experience access to the real world, but what we do experience is a phenomenal world as conveyed by our senses. So, we cannot, now this is a very philosophical question. And if you look at some Indian philosophies like Buddhism, they ask the same question again essentially that what is there in the mind is what we think is out there essentially. That is what Kant is saying essentially. And he says that human concepts and categories structure the view of the world as we see it essentially. So, the world is not as, as it is out there, but as we see it essentially. So, the world as we know it essentially. So, this is known as the subject object problem essentially. A long standing philosophical issue is concerned with analysis of human experience. So, the question is that the world consists of objects and entities which are perceived or otherwise presumed to exist as entities by subjects. Essentially. So, there is a subject. So, we think that the world has this object out there and how does that happen essentially. Okay, so, some technical terms which we should be familiar with. So, the subject object problem has two, two primary aspects. First is what is known, what can exist out there and this is something that we call as ontology. It become very popular in current day computer science. So, the field of ontology deals with questions concerning what exists or what can be can said to be exist essentially and how such entities are grouped together essentially, related within a hierarchy and that kind of a thing. 
So nowadays computer scientists talk a lot about ontologies and the, in the concept of the semantic webs. So we have want computers to talk to another one computer sitting here to meaningfully talk to another computer and we have this notion of ontologies and taxonomies uh, which we may not have time to go through in this course. The second standpoint is how does one know what we know essentially and this concerns epistemology questions as to how knowledge is acquired. Okay. So ontology says what can exist and epistemology is concerned with how do we get the real facts of for example, why was Durga suspended? Epistemic question, how do we say that this is what is really happened out there essentially. So that is the question of knowledge acquisition or epistemology and the bounds of our own mind. So he create, so Kant says that he has done something like a Copernican revolution in philosophy. So what he calls as critical philosophy, so he says there are two things, one is the epistemology of transcendental idealism which says that we are not able to transcend the bounds of our own mind, we can only perceive the world through the prism of our mind in some sense or through the spectacles or glasses of our mind and we cannot exceed that. So we cannot access the real world out there, only what our mind allows us to see. So already the notion of mind has become so prominent essentially. And the moral philosophy, the moral philosophy in those days was not quite what we talk about it as right now, but something to do with the mental world, the moral philosophy of the autonomy of practical reason. He says that you know practical reason can be automated. So maybe this is the last thing I will leave you with. Conceptual unification and integration is carried out by the mind through concepts or the categories of understanding. So this is again those terms from ontologies are coming up. We have concepts about things. We know we have categories of birds and you know flowers and apple and fruits and all these kind of categories are things. Operational on the perceptual manifold which is built within space and time. We say space and time is something fundamental to our minds. Our minds think in terms of space and time and everything that we think about is located within the notion, our notions of space and time. They are not concepts but are forms that are a priori necessary conditions for any possible experience. He says that without this notion of say space and time we would not have been able to imagine the world and think about the world. Thus the objective order of nature and the causal necessity that operates within it are dependent upon the mind's processes okay, which he called by a product of a rule based activity which he called as a synthesis. So the emphasis has totally shifted to the human mind, it is a human mind which shapes the way we see the world and we reason about the world and everything is dependent upon that. Okay. So from a notion when we, we did not even have a notion of a mind and then gradually we said thought and reality is different and then mind body is different, Kant has come taken us to a point which says that our interaction with the world is controlled by our mind essentially. So this is what we will do in the next class. Just to remind you of the goal that Hogeland that we have set, the goal of AI is to build a machine with a mind of its own. So in the next class we will come back to this Kantian view of the mind and discuss a little bit more and maybe wind up with the introduction in the on next Wednesday.